and welcome to Fall COVID Shots Explained. I'm Natasha Ray. More than a season of colored foliage and cooler weather, fall is also the time of year that respiratory illness goes on the uptick. Whether it's flu, RSV, or COVID, there's a good chance someone you know is or has recently been ill. So what are the best options for protecting yourself this season from respiratory viruses like COVID? I'm joined by Dr. Don Bowdish to discuss just that. Don is a professor in the Department of Medicine at McMaster University and the Canada Research Chair in Aging and Immunity. Welcome, Dr. Bowdish. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for coming. So I heard recently that the thought that being in the cold will make you sick is no longer an old wives' tale. It actually is true, and there's research to support this. So is this why flu, the fall is called flu, COVID, and RSV season? It's a great question. So it's true that some respiratory viruses like influenza and RSV can use that little bit of boost the cold weather brings. It's multifactorial. So one of the things we do is we socialize indoors. We have fewer barbecues and more family dinners inside and that can lead to spread. We also have the back to school period where all the kids from all over the country are going back into those small little, not very well ventilated classrooms and bringing that home. And then the change in the humidity and the dryness of the air can lead to that sort of mucusy layer in your nose and mouth being a bit thin and allowing some viruses in. Now, what I think is super interesting is people who are from parts of the world where it's more temperate near the equator, they don't have a peak of cold and flu season. It's sort of consistent throughout the year. But in the northern hemisphere, we do have that generally runs between about November and, and March. COVID's a little bit of an outlier because it seems to peak at multiple times during the year. We've had the March peaks. Uh, this wave sort of started in August. So it's a little bit of an outlier. But for most respiratory infections, October to, to March is around where it, the flu season is. Yes, and, and as you mentioned, we've seen more COVID in the last little while. We're seeing more hospitalizations. So can we again this year expect a triple-demic? I think we won't be so poorly off as last year. And the reason I say that is we often use the Southern Hemisphere to sort of guess what the Northern Hemisphere is going to look like. So Australia has really, really good data. And because their winter is our summer, they go through their season first and we use that to predict. They had a pretty bad year for influenza. It peaked a little earlier than normal. There was quite a lot of influenza, but it went down quickly. Their pediatric population still had a lot of RSV, which caused hospitalizations, but it wasn't as bad as the year before. So although I think this year will be challenging for us, I don't think it will be quite as bad as it was last year. But we also have to keep in mind, across Canada, all our health systems were strained before cold and flu season. So you add a little bit more strain and there could be knock-on effects. So it's not just the doctors who deal with the infections, but it's other parts of the healthcare system that end up being compromised by even a slight increase in, in infections. And research shows that after a pandemic, you usually lose about 20% of your healthcare population. Right. So we're also up against that. I do want to talk a little bit about the flu and COVID. Mm -hmm. So when COVID was sort of out per mm -hmm. se, and then we had a few years of COVID and people were saying, well, where's the flu? I'm not mm -hmm. hearing about the flu anymore. But we know if we work in healthcare that the flu still mm -hmm. very much exists. So can you speak a little bit about typical flu stats in Canada in terms of the flu? And then also is the mortality rate higher with the flu versus mm -hmm. COVID? This is a great question. I think it would surprise a lot of your listeners to hear that influenza and pneumonia, which we sort of pair together, have been in the top 10 causes of death in Canada for decades. Wow. And I find this shocking because it's vaccine preventable and because it's something people don't hear about or think about in that context. So for decades, we've had influenza and pneumonia uh, being in that top 10 causes of death, and now COVID has joined it. So when we do a side-by-side -side comparison about who's worse, there's two things we look at. We look at how many hospitalizations, how many people get so sick that they need medical care, but we can also look at some of the longer-term consequences because any serious respiratory infection, be it pneumonia, be it influenza, be it RSV or COVID, is associated with increased heart attacks, um, dementia and cognitive decline, and other health issues. So when we do that head-to-head -head comparison, COVID generally comes out as worse. It generally looks a little bit worse, and it could be because we don't have a history of exposure to that. Uh, many of us have had dozens of flu shots over our lives, and those sort of add up to help protect us in our old age, but we haven't had that experience with COVID yet. And so whether in the long run it's going to stay that way, but so far COVID looks a little bit worse for both current infections and those long-term health consequences that come. 
And can you speak a little bit to that statement we often hear when people say, well, where did the flu go? How yes. come we don't have the flu anymore? Like, I, I know there's yes. a reason and there's a science behind that, and yes. I'm happy you're here to tell us what that is. <laughs> well, interestingly, influenza is far less contagious than COVID. So when we took all those protective measures for COVID, the masking and the shutdowns and all those other things we did, it had a bigger impact on some of those and uh, other infections that were less contagious. Right. And so influenza is something that we've now learned we really do have a lot of control over by changing either the structures around us, by having better ventilation or having air purification systems or by wearing a mask. So. The one thing that we've come out of this is that we actually have more control about our environment and how that leads us to be exposed to influenza and other infections than we'd previously understood. And what is the best line of defense? So when you walked in here today, I noticed you were wearing your mask, mm -hmm. but now because we are far enough apart, you felt safe taking it off. Mm -hmm. And I know you've brought one with you as yes. well. So could we just talk a little bit about the best ways to defend ourselves against these illnesses? Absolutely. So what we now understand about COVID is that it really is an airborne uh, inf infection. So in the early days, we thought it was a little bit more like influenza where you had to like cough and actually get those tiny little, it's so horrible to think about those <laughs> tiny little saliva particles. Right. Um, but we now understand that it can live in really, really, really small, small droplets that can stay in the air for a long time. So consequently, a person with COVID could be in the room and they could leave, but that air circulates for a while so you could come in and, and breathe that air and become sick again. Mm -hmm. And that helps us understand uh, things like why, you know, you can still get COVID in an empty room if it had just been populated by a bunch of sick people. So for me, I've made the choice for me and my family to continue to wear a mask because I don't want to infect the older adults in my life and the people who are really vulnerable. And I don't want to take the risk of having long-term health issues that come with COVID. Um, and masking is probably the number one thing we can do to protect ourselves. But we also need to think about the ventilation we're in. So we're in a lovely big room here. There's lots of air circulation. Uh, you and I are you know, far apart. There's not many people in the room. So the chance of that COVID building up in the air is, is pretty low. Right. If I were going to a concert or I was going to be on a crowded plane, then you're exactly right. I would change the type of mask I use and I would make sure that I was masked. And I brought a model if you'd like I to did, see I did and I would like to see that, but I just want to drill down a little bit more because um, just another piece or statement that you hear a lot is just around masking doesn't do anything. But I think there's a distinction that needs to be made because when you're wearing the mask, you're protecting those around you, am I correct? And not necessarily, or how, how does that work exactly? Yeah, so this is actually interesting because it's one of the things our understandings changed from the beginning of the pandemic. So in the beginning of the pandemic, we were wearing surgical masks like surgeons wear, the blue masks, uh, you know, if you watch uh, ER, the, the ones you see the doctors wearing in that. And those ones, because they have the gaps at the side, you're still sort of breathing in the room air, but you're not spitting. And so infections that are spread by those droplets are really protected and you're protecting the people around you, but you're not getting that protection because the air you're breathing is coming in through the sides. Right. So as we move through the pandemic, we realize that if we want to protect ourselves, what we have to use is a higher quality mask that's a little bit more sealed around the sides of our face. And in that way, all the air we breathe comes through the mask and it filters out the virus in the air. Um, and we're not breathing in through the sides. So the type of mask we use has changed uh, pretty fundamentally during the pandemic. And you did bring a good I example did, of a mask. So if you could show that to our viewers. So this is the one I wear for everyday use. And so it's called an N95 and it allows me to clip it around my nose. Now I am blessed with what we call a strong profile or a <laughs> nose that can hold up a mask. So I don't me find, <laughs> yes, I know. Um, so I don't find it hard to keep the earbands on and to make this really tight seat around my face so I'm breathing through it but if I were not blessed with such a strong profile or if I was on like an airplane or if I was in a concert where there were lots of people then I might upgrade to this sort of um, stronger mask which um, clips behind the head and so that doesn't hurt your ears after a long period of time and the way these masks are made they really form a really strong seal so you're protected from uh, even in higher risk situations. So just one more mask question mm -hmm. that I have. Sorry, I remember from my university days when mm -hmm. we would wear those masks, yes. we would have to 
switch them out pretty often yes. because they become porous. Yes. So is that the same with these masks? Yes, all masks have a lifespan. Right. And so one of the things that I find frustrating is that they're expensive, the good masks, and that makes them inaccessible for people. And so people have to use them for a lot longer than they need to. So ideally the mask doesn't become wet because that'll change the porosity. And uh, if you're in a humid day and you're breathing for a really long time, these ones, when we use them in the lab, we say you can use them for eight hours. Okay. That's probably a bit of an exaggeration and you can stretch that out. But you do need to switch out your masks occasionally because, and they get little micro tears, you know, the bending in them will eventually end up tearing them. So basically you would have to change them every day if you're a, a daily yeah, user I, of masks. Exactly. I, that would be ideal, but I think for, especially these stronger ones, I think for a common use, we can get away with a few days. And it's frustrating because you can't buy them at your local pharmacy. Yeah. You have to order them online, which makes it difficult. And then there's quality control issues. It's really, really frustrating to me that people can't get good information about masks. Right. But at least now we're getting good information now because I keep <laughs> having this vision of seeing people driving around in their cars with the blue surgical mask yes. hanging down. And I'm like, you've been wearing that for months and yes. I don't think it's doing anything yes, anymore yes. and I will say you know if that's the only mask you can get some protection is always better than no mm -hmm. protection anything's better than nothing so I don't want it to be I don't want people to feel if it is unaffordable to them or it's inaccessible yes. I don't want them to feel that they can't make good decisions with the tools that they have at hand great and so um, a question that we're getting a lot of calls about is when is this year's flu mm -hmm. shot going to be available and as well the, the COVID booster, when are these That's shots going to be available and are they available now? Yes, well one of the things that I think has been a bit frustrating to me is that we could have had the COVID boosters already because we had Health Canada approval in the summer. Okay. And just to give you a little bit of a timeline about how these things usually work. So Health Canada reviews applications for vaccines and says, are they safe and do they work? The National Advisory Council on Immunization reviews the data and makes recommendations, but each province decides to implement those differently. So across Canada, we have provinces that really want to focus only on vaccinating the most vulnerable, mm -hmm. and we have provinces that recommend that everyone be vaccinated. And then the provinces have to decide how many vaccines they want and how they're going to deliver them because some provinces use pharmacies more, some use public health units, and so there's a lot of variation in that. The approval for this year's vaccine, which is targeted towards the current circulating COVID variant, uh, came a while ago, but the distribution has been a bit slower. Okay. And so we've sort of missed the beginning of that wave for that. The hope is that it will be available by the end of October okay. for most people, most of the places. And the flu shot, because influenza season comes a bit later, is always starts with like healthcare workers and high risk people in October. And then generally the general public starts November, December. Great, thank you. And we've spoken a lot about RSV. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us what RSV actually is and how does it differ from COVID and the flu? I'm really glad you asked because RSV is a terrible virus that no one's ever heard of. Right. <laughs> so it's called respiratory syncytial virus and it's a virus like so many respiratory viruses that really affects the young and the old. Some children uh, have their first exposure and have a terrible reaction to it and need to get medical care and we saw that in a big way last year. But what people don't understand is it often infects older adults and sends them to the hospital. It also frequently causes outbreaks in retirement homes and long-term care facilities. And RSV, like other respiratory infections, is not only associated with getting sick, but having health issues after that infection. And for years, we had nothing but supportive care. You know, you go to the hospital and they treat you the same way you treat any respiratory infection. This is the first year that we have a Health Canada approved vaccine for older adults for RSV. And I can tell you people in infectious disease have been delighted about this because it really is, can be a very devastating infection. Unfortunately, again, we have different provinces rolling out this vaccine in different ways and targeting different groups. Yes, I want to speak a little bit about that. So every province is looking different in terms of rollout and also in terms of cost. So we know in mm -hmm. Ontario, the cost is covered, I believe, if you're 60 plus. So mm -hmm. what will the rollout look like in this province? So in Ontario, we are uh, looking forward to a rollout in the long-term care sector first, which I think is excellent because it's caused so many outbreaks and we've seen outbreaks uh, come back as, as COVID measures have been lifted. That's the right place to start. 
but in truth, all older adults should look into getting this vaccine. And so the hope is that uh, it will soon become accessible to older adults everywhere. One of the things we struggle with in the province of Ontario is deciding who's going to pay. And I think one of the things older adults have a lot of power is advocating for their politicians to get this covered. And I'll give you an example where this sort of advocacy had big impacts. So the first election when the Ford government came in, one of their election platform provinces was to provide a high dose influenza vaccine for older adults because that's the one that works the best, but it's the one that costs the most. Mm -hmm. And through advocacy, that became an election promise. And so this is something that we as citizens of Canada have power over if we write to our local politicians and demand that this become accessible and we prioritize the health of older adults and other vulnerable populations. And I'm happy you brought up advocacy because I'm sure as our viewers know, CARP is major in terms of the advocacy that we've done with healthcare and in other areas. So our viewers can definitely look to carp.ca to see what other advocacy efforts Absolutely. can happen. Um, so do you find that COVID will be easier to prevent with the new vaccine being available fairly soon? I'm excited about this new vaccine. So one of the things that we were so optimistic at the beginning of the pandemic and I've been so wrong about was the idea that... Um, it's nice when you can admit yeah, you're yes. wrong. I struggle <laughs> with that. <laughs> the coronavirus family of virus of which COVID is one is not a fast mutator. So we had this vision that we would come up with one vaccine, everyone would get vaccinated, and then it would be over. Mm. And what we found in real life was that actually these variants, these mutations have happened and made the original vaccine less effective. Right. So there's a really important change in the wording of how we talk about this vaccine. We don't call it a booster anymore. It's not a booster. It's not to just give you a little, little boost of your immunity. It's sort of like the flu vaccine. Right. Every year we have a new flu vaccine to target the new variant of the flu. And we're going to, moving forward, have vaccines that target the specific variants or variant families, as I call them. The one that we have that's currently approved and we're waiting for the rollout for targets the current circulating variants. Preliminary data looks very promising that it will be highly protective and will hopefully be so good that we see a reduction in transmission as well as serious disease. And I wonder if by us treating this vaccine is more of like how we've treated the flu shot that people will be more accepting of it because I'm sure as mm -hmm. we all saw there wasn't there was a lot of unacceptance of mm -hmm. the vaccine when it came out so hopefully by making it just a regular part of our mm -hmm. vaccine regime it will become more accepted. Mm -hmm. I do want to go back to when you were speaking about the spike that started in August yes. and has sort of gone into the fall and then you mentioned there was also a spike in March so what do you attribute these COVID mm -hmm. spikes to and how could we try and prevent these moving forward? This is a great question. So we're still learning a lot about this virus. It's important to remember that we've been in studying influenza for decades and we don't have all the answers. So this virus still has a few surprises for us. <laughs> but we can infer things from both the timing of these different waves and also from experiences of other parts of the world. One of the things that Canada has been really good at is getting people vaccinated, especially older adults. And so this allows us to look at the timing for how long that protection lasts. And we sort of have a, a sort of a mental timeline about this virus. In the pre-Omicron, before we had Omicron, it looks like it, once you had your vaccine or if you'd had an infection, you had at least six months of protection, if not more. Then Omicron came. And Omicron, that was sort of Christmas uh, 2022, um, Omicron came along and it was a different beast. It's what we call immune evasive, meaning that those antibodies and those immune responses we make don't last as long. And so now we saw that many of the Omicron waves came about every three, four, five months. And we know that that means that period of protection gets shorter and shorter. So the time you're protected from your recent infection or from your vaccine seems to be getting shorter and shorter, especially in older adults. And when you're developing a vaccine, like say for the, the flu shot or the COVID mm -hmm. vaccine, if we're looking at this being a yearly thing, how do researchers and pharmaceutical companies anticipate what these strains are going 
to be so that mm -hmm. this is a useful annual vaccine for us to have? This is such a great question. Historically, what we did is we looked for influenza in the southern hemisphere. We right. said, okay, what happened in Australia? Okay, and then we'll make some predictions about which strains are going to make it up to Canada or North America or the northern hemisphere. And some years we got it right and some years we got it wrong. But the flu vaccines take a long time to make. So you needed that six or nine months headway to get to make those vaccines. And in the COVID universe, we don't have that kind of time because like I said, they come at these three, four, five month intervals. So one of the big advantages of the mRNA vaccines is they're actually easier to make and easier to change. And the hope is that moving forward, we'll again be sort of monitoring the situation and saying, okay, where, where in the world are they starting to see a bit of an uptake? Let's get on it and get the vaccine prepared so we can protect the rest of the world. And that sort of global monitoring right. is so important in making predictions about what's going to happen in Canada and the rest of the Northern Hemisphere. And that's an important piece of information to know because mm -hmm. a lot of people are saying, well, how do they even know which strains are coming up? Mm -hmm. But you completely forget about the entire mm -hmm. southern <laughs> hemisphere of the earth right. that helps us do that prediction. Right. And do you think with mRNA uh, vaccines being a little bit more nimble, that they'll be mm -hmm. used more with flu shots and, and other vaccines? So there are clinical trials right now for combinations. So where you can have COVID and influenza or COVID and RSV and influenza. And I think this is so important because we've always struggled to get adult vaccination up to the levels it needs to be. With kids, it's a little bit easier because you have these scheduled visits, you know, it's in the schedule. Every doctor, every family doctor, every pediatrician knows that when they come in at six months, they get this vaccine and it's very standardized. But with adults, it relies on you and me remembering that we need a vaccine, making the time to go get that vaccine and having it not inconvenience our lives, which sometimes uh, these things can do. And in some cases, paying for that vaccine for some of our adult vaccines. So the, anything we can do to sort of condense and make it easier will not only provide protection to more people, but will help with the uptake, I think, with getting these vaccines uh, in arms instead of on shelves. Yes. Um, when we go back to talking about the spike with COVID, mm -hmm. are there any groups that are more vulnerable or are more affected by these spikes? And are mm -hmm. we going, to, I'm, I'm hearing that we're going to see mortality rates that are not going to be similar to 2020 and 2021. Mm -hmm. And could you speak to that? Absolutely. One of the misconceptions about Omicron when it hit was that it was less severe. And this is kind of a little bit of a, a balance between how serious something is and how infectious it is. So surprisingly, even for this virus, which on a person by person va basis maybe looks a little bit less severe, killed way more people. And in fact, COVID remains the number one cause of hospitalization for older adults in Canada. So it hasn't gone away, but the age is shifting to the, those, those people who are hospitalized. So in 2020, 2021, 20, people in their 60s were sort of the median age, about half the people younger, half the people older. In 2022, it was people 70 plus. And so we're good at getting people outside of the hospital after they have that infection. We're good at treating it. We've really reduced the mortality rate. But if you're sick enough to end up in the hospital, especially if you're older, it can be a long recovery once you get out. And many of those hospitalized older adults are not going back to the lives they once had. So even though the death rate's going down, we really should be focusing on keeping them out of the hospital to make sure they have as many years of healthy, active living as they deserve. And that um, kind of brings up two questions as well. And, and one that I know I'm sure you've spoken about time and time again yeah. to people, after, person after person, but the, the vaccine is to prevent the severity. Mm -hmm. It will not, or will it, help prevent transmission? This is such an important question. And I'll just give you the flu data to sort of orient to you what we can expect, and then I'll tell you about uh, COVID. So with influenza, it uh, has about, on a good year, about 60% protection from any symptoms. So 60% chance you will have no symptoms. But that goes down by 10% each month. So in the second month, 50% protection from any infection, uh, 40, 30. That's okay because influenza season is six months. So you get one vaccine, it covers you through that six months. But despite the fact you might be more likely to have a symptomatic infection at the end of that flu season, your protection from hospitalization, death, heart attacks, and other bad things remains high. 
So for adult vaccines, we can expect to have some protection from symptomatic infection, although not forever. Mm. And we can expect longer protection against hospitalization. Our current understanding of how well the vaccines protect against COVID is about 60% protection from symptomatic infection, but that goes down by about 10% every month. The, the protection from hospitalization and death is extremely high and only starts to fall after about nine to 12 months for older adults. So this just speaks to the fact that if you've had one, two, three, even four vaccines, you still need to get to your vaccine this cold and flu season right. to keep you out of hospital. And so I'm gonna put my second question behind for right now because I have another question. Mm -hmm. So what if I have had COVID? Yes. Um, do I need, do I still need to get vaccinated? Because mm -hmm. there was a study out of Israel that people mm -hmm. kept quoting, um, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure even where the study is at right now, that said natural immunity is just as good, mm -hmm. if not better than the vaccine. And I'm not, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true or not, but. Could you tell me if it is? Yes. So again, we have to split between the pre-Omicron era and the Omicron era. Right. In the pre-Omicron era, it looked as though vaccine plus infection was always the best. Mm -hmm. It provided at least six, if not nine months or more protection. Um, and then came, you know, either vaccine or infection. In the Omicron era, unfortunately, things have changed. So people can get repeat Omicron infections if they're not vaccinated one after the other. Um, if you are vaccinated and infected, our recommendation from the National Advisory Council on Immunization is wait six months till your next vaccine. Many health units are evaluating the data though and saying actually older adults aren't always protected from that infection, the Omicron infection. So many health units allow people to get vaccinated after three months after that infection. And some don't even count the infection in older adults. And this is why these recommendations are so challenging because everybody's different. Kids seem to have longer lasting protection. So they probably don't need a vaccine after they've had their infection for at least six months. Mm -hmm. But if you're over 70 and you have comorbid conditions, you probably do need to be vaccinated. And teasing out all these data is so challenging. It makes it really difficult to provide blanket recommendations for everybody. Yes, and there are some resources that we'll talk about mm -hmm. um, later on that do help, I think, a little bit in terms of do I need the vaccine? How long do I mm -hmm. wait? How long should I wait between um, doses? So we will get to that, but I do want to bring back my other question because you spoke about hospitalization yes. and how it can lead to a real change in quality of life mm -hmm. after. And I want to ask you about long COVID. Yes. So is long COVID still affecting people mm -hmm. with COVID with these particular strains? And is, all, is that also what you were talking about when you were saying like leaving the hospital doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you're now okay? Mm -hmm. Long COVID's uh, such a tragedy. And just to give your viewers some context, long COVID is sort of described as, as symptoms that don't resolve after the infection or get worse. And the most common ones are cognitive issues. So not being able to concentrate, having brain fog, fatigue, especially what we call post-exertional fatigue. So, you know, you go to the grocery store and you have to have a nap for two and a half hours, respiratory issues, and there are a host of other ones. What people don't know is that actually many serious respiratory infections come with long-term health issues, mm -hmm. but COVID really does seem to cause them worse than other ones. So we know that people who got infected before they were vaccinated have the highest chance of having long COVID and are the least likely to get better. We know that people who were vaccinated and then got COVID can still have long COVID, but they have a better chance of getting better. Not 100%, but a better chance of getting better. We know that the sicker you are, the more likely you are to get long COVID. So if you were on a ventilator, you're much more likely than if you were just sick at home. But even people who've had really mild infections can have long COVID. What we don't know, because these variants move so quickly, is how bad the current variants are. One of the reasons I keep my mask on indoors is because none of us gets to know if we're one of those susceptible people. And we know that people who did okay with their first COVID infection sometimes come down with long COVID during their second infection. And until we have better data about protection from vaccination, until we have better data about who's at risk and why they're at risk, for me, I've made the choice to keep my mask on and try to protect myself. 
And I want to talk about protection because there is a saying that you can have a layered defense yes. against COVID. So what does that mean and how do you practice having mm -hmm. a layered defense? I love this question because I'm an immunologist, so everyone expects me to say, just get vaccinated and you'll be fine. Right. But I There's do not so say that. <laughs> <laughs> because in truth, we have structural issues. So one of the reasons Canada's long-term care sector had the most COVID deaths in the world wow. was because we don't have good regulations about air quality and air ventilation. So there are the buildings around us, the schools we send our kids to don't have the ventilation that would protect us from all respiratory infections, including COVID. So that's one structural thing that we can think about. Um, on top of the air ventilation, we can think about masking and making decisions about socializing indoors and outdoors. Another issue that we have in Canada is we don't have good sick day rules. Right. So we have people who go to work sick because they don't have a lot of options. That also leads to an increased infection. Uh, we have masking and we can do, hand washing is not so important for COVID, but certainly for other respiratory infections, it's really important and sterilizing more for other respiratory infections. And then after we do all of those things, vaccinations are a really good tool. I, I remember in the early days of COVID when my husband would bring home groceries <laughs> and we would wipe everything mm -hmm. down and. And, and even talking to people about hand washing, and I thought to myself, well, aren't people already washing their hands? <laughs> Did it take COVID to remind you to do that? So, so it, like that seems a little extreme, yeah. but still wiping surfaces, wearing masks, and washing your hands, I think is always a good. It's always good. It's always a good thing to do. It's certainly you know that is so important for all the uh, gastrointestinal infections. That is where you want to be. I mean. Viruses come in multiple flavors and some of them are quite resistant to uh, alcohol cleaners and things like that. The ones that cause like noroviruses that are always causing cruise ship disasters. You want to really wash your hands for that. That's my fear. That's why I'll never go on a cruise That's ship. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but the ones that we breathe like COVID, it's less important. So. COVID vaccination coverage is fairly high in mm -hmm. Canada. So it says here 83% of the population is vaccinated mm -hmm. with at least one dose. So can you speak, and you've spoken to this a little bit already about the importance of those who are high risk and mm -hmm. older adults getting vaccinated and who really falls under that high risk population. Mm -hmm. Like I've had people ask me if they're pregnant, should they yes. be getting the vaccine? Am I high risk or is it worse to get the vaccine? So could you speak a little That's bit a to that? Really important question. There's two parts to your question. You. Having had one dose is good because it does reduce hospitalizations, but the number I look at is who's been vaccinated in the last six months okay. because that gives us that protection from symptomatic infection and helps us stop transmitting to the people we care about. And that number sits around 15%. So when we think about this cold and flu season, we should really think about trying to get the population vaccinated. And so who's the most vulnerable? You brought up pregnant women, and I'm so glad you did because... One of this... my best friends just had a baby, like <laughs> literally a few hours ago, so oh, pregnant wow. women are on my mind. <laughs> Last year, we had an absolutely terrible year for six-month-old and less, like little, little babies ending up in the hospital with both COVID, influenza, and RSV. Mm -hmm. Pregnant women can prevent that by getting vaccinated because when you're pregnant, you pass on all those antibodies to your baby, and you can give them six months of protection. So pregnant women are both more susceptible to severe COVID infections and having bad things happen to mom and baby. If a woman gets um, infected while she's pregnant, she's more likely to have a small baby or have complications during the birth, but she can pass on that protection. So I always think of vaccination as a family affair mm -hmm. because it's not just about me, it's about the pregnant woman in my life, it's about the person who's starting chemotherapy who can't be protected by vaccination because their immune system is being altered by chemotherapy or people on immunosuppressant drugs. Again, they rely on the rest of us to be vaccinated to help protect them when vaccines can't work. And of course, older adults in general, unfortunately, don't respond as well to vaccination. So again, they need our help to make sure that the whole family is vaccinated. And just to follow up on the, the pregnancy piece, because I feel like I know a lot of pregnant people right now, <laughs> is there an ideal time within mm -hmm. your pregnancy for a second or third trimester that you should or shouldn't be getting um, this vaccine? Any time is good. Or any uh, vaccine. If you, it, it sort of depends on what the rates are. So you want to make sure, the best time to be vaccinated is right before a peak of a wave, because that's when you're most likely to get infected. Um, but certainly that six months of protection you get, you'll pass on some fraction of that to your baby um, when you have that baby. So any time is good. 
uh, but it sort of depends on the local rate. So you want to make sure you don't get that infection. So if there's a wave starting, off you go. And I do want to talk about, and I'm sure you get asked this a lot, about side effects mm -hmm. um, associated with the COVID vaccine. And I would like if you could speak a little bit to some of the, I don't know if it's the stories or the, mm -hmm. the, almost the conspiracies that we hear around what happens when you get a COVID, mm -hmm. COVID vaccine. And we hear a lot about myocarditis. Mm -hmm. And then if someone passes, oh, it must have been because they got the yes. COVID vaccine. So can you tell me um, accurately and reliably what some of those side effects are? And what are some of the things that we hear a lot about that really um, haven't been proven to be attributed to the vaccine? I'm really glad you brought this up because it's a scary world out there. If you look <laughs> on the internet, yeah. it would be terrifying to have to make this decision. Yeah. And this is actually going back to the pregnancy. One of the things women feel is, well, it's probably safer to do nothing than take yes. a risk. Yeah. And that's not the case. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm an immunologist who study vaccines. So people expect me to say vaccines are safe all the time, but I would never say that because it's not true. Right. So there are side effects that could happen and we group them into serious and not serious. The vast majority are non-serious, but that doesn't mean they're not pleasant. When I got my second dose, and your second dose of any vaccine is usually the one you feel it the most, I was sick in bed for half a day. I felt terrible. I had the headache and the chills. That's my body responding to the vaccine. And so the way vaccines work is we have to have a little bit of inflammation mm -hmm. to make them work. But that inflammation feels like being sick to us. So that headache, the chills, the feeling poorly, the uh, you know, the achy arm and things like that are all part of my body's immune response. As unpleasant as those are, we don't call them serious because they resolve and go away. The serious side effects can happen when the immune system gets sort of the wrong signal and starts attacking part of us. Right. So there are a number of scary sounding syndromes, Guillain-Barre, transverse myelitis, where people have a really, really rare reaction where their immune system attacks, especially their nerves. Um, and in young people, we did see that there was an increase in myocarditis, which is swelling of the heart. What we've learned since then is that young people, especially young boys, have such active immune systems that actually it's a risk for almost any vaccine, not just mm -hmm. the COVID vaccines. Um, it's just we had a lot of vaccines, so we were able to find this myocarditis. Mm -hmm. But let me put that in context for you. Those scary things also happen in the context of COVID, but at least 10 times greater rate. Right. So if you're making a decision, am I gonna get COVID or am I gonna get a vaccine? No matter what scary thing you've heard of, your chance of having that happen during a COVID infection is at least 10 times higher than having it in the context of a vaccine. And also in the context of the general population. I think sometimes people yes. forget that you'll get clots and yes. things in the general population. That's right. That's and right. I think it's a one in 1,000 people will That's get right. a blood clot. That's right. And so. The timing of these things is challenging, of course, because here we were in the middle of a pandemic. Everybody got vaccinated at the same time. And of course, all the bad things that happened to us were still happening. Somebody would have a heart attack. Somebody would yeah. uh, have a clot. Somebody would have an autoimmune condition diagnosed. Somebody would have all these things. But because they were at the same time, yes. <laughs> we, a lot of times that was attributed to the COVID vaccine. And what we now know is, uh, because we have really good data monitoring systems to find these things, is that many of the things that seem scary, you know, your friend had this thing happen a week after they got their vaccine, um, were actually just a coincidence. Right. The vast majority of serious, serious side effects that happen to vaccination happen in less than six weeks after that vaccine. Right. So if anything happens after six weeks, it's astronomically unlikely to be tied into the, to the vaccine. And that's good information to know. I remember when the vaccines were first coming out, there was a lot of sort of vaccine shopping. Yes. I heard this one's better mm -hmm. than this one, and this one's better than this one if you're this person. So are there some COVID shots that are more effective than others? And I'm sure, again, this is very much population-based yes, as well. Yes, absolutely. In general, obviously, what we always say is the shot in your arm is the best shot. But there are some interesting uh, ways we can tailor it to the population. So as an example, we have vaccines that we give to kids that are a little bit lower dose, tailored to them, and also avo avoid that myocarditis. My own research is on older adults. And one of the things that we found is that Moderna provides longer lasting and better protection than Pfizer. Okay. And we don't think that that's because of there's some you know, fundamental difference in the two vaccines, except Moderna has more mRNA in it. And just like influenza vaccines, the ones we give to older adults work better if there's a little bit more in it. You know, we have that sort of 
immune system that doesn't work quite so well as we get older, so we just give it more. And so Moderna is the recommended vaccine for older adults. Um, and in fact, one of the reasons Canada fares a little bit better in having a few fewer infections is thought to be because we've relied so heavily on the Moderna vaccines. And so are there specific criteria or recommendations for different age groups or mm -hmm. populations? Um, so you said Moderna has a little bit more of the messenger mm -hmm. RNA, so it's better for older populations, but is it maybe not as good for, I, I think I heard under 40, it maybe wasn't as the, recommended. One of the things that we did is with the AstraZeneca vaccine, we quickly changed uh, some of the regulations around that for the clotting. We don't use that one in Canada anymore. And we now have sort of child-sized formulations of both the Pfizer and the Moderna. So in the very early days, we said teen boys should only get Pfizer because there's less mRNA in there and then they won't have the myocarditis. But now we sort of adjusted that and there's no increased risk. So we have effectively good recommendations for older adults. Moderna is a good choice for you. Um, and for the rest of the population, in truth, all the vaccines work really, really well. And, and this is a question that's sort of like beating a dead horse, but we're going to keep saying this yes. to drive the message home. So if you've already been vaccinated and have been getting your boosters, do you still need to get a shot this fall? Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought this up because one of the miscommunications we really had, and I I'll, uh, I'll take responsibility on behalf of the scientific community, is we gave people this idea, it was like two and then you were done. Yes. No, three, you one more booster and then, oh, oh, no, no, four. And people thought there was gonna be some magic number and you would be done, yeah. but it's not going to be like that. It's like the flu shot. I've probably had 20 some odd flu shots in my life and if all goes well, I hope to have 40 or 50 more. Mm -hmm. And the COVID vaccines are going to be like that too. So I will probably never be done getting my COVID shots. And even if you've had one, two, three, four, five, you still want to get this one because it's tailored to the circulating variants and will help both stop spreading to the people you love, but also help protect your health. And I, I do want to speak a little bit about the, the booster after booster mm. after booster. And I, you know, I think the, the PR campaign yes. around that really, not, I'm not saying there was a PR campaign, but it just, the, it really gave people vaccine fatigue yes. and they were like, they're going to be making us do this for the rest of our lives, which unfortunately is probably true. So could you speak a little bit to maybe how that's being combated and how mm -hmm. are we sort of trying to shift the message so that people can overcome this vaccine mm -hmm. fatigue? I think we will need to get a lot of different allies in this conversation. I think one of the things, once we have it set into our pediatric campaign, that'll help a lot too, because it's really hard for parents to navigate right now. Who, when, what about the kids? Do the kids still need it? What if my kids had one dose? What do, it's all very complicated. Newborn babies, what do they need? When do they need it? Mm -hmm. So once we have it set that you go to the doctor at this and this visit, that'll help with the, the, the young campaign. What gets very difficult is for adult vaccinations because we don't see our doctors on a regular basis. We don't have it set like that. So what we'll need to do is have campaigns. And it would be convenient if COVID would come at the same time as flu. So we could say to everyone, yes. get your flu shot and your COVID shot at the same time. COVID is not listening to my request <laughs> to time that. Maybe you need to send it a message a different way. A carrier pigeon, I heard, is always helpful that. because it's airborne. That was a <laughs> that really was a good, good joke, one. That right? That was a good Thank one. You. That was very, very good. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, I do have some audience questions that I wanted sure. to ask you before we run out of time. So we have a question from Deanna. I am an 82-year-old female with coronary artery disease. I had COVID on September 2nd with a fever for two days. The only symptom I still have is dry cough about mm -hmm. once a day. My last booster was May 4th. Mm -hmm. My question is, due to my age and medical history, can I get my booster um, in early December or my COVID shot mm -hmm. since we're no longer saying mm -hmm. booster? I'm going on a trip south to be with family. I totally respect wanting to get your vaccines before you're traveling because we know that being on a plane is very challenging and nobody wants a vacation ruined by COVID. No. So I know when I, I try to time my vaccines around travel plans. The official National Advisory Council and Immunization Guidelines are to wait six months from your last infection or booster. However, most public health units acknowledge that for older adults, you shouldn't wait that long. And so what I'd recommend is speak to your pharmacist or family doctor or public health unit, because for most of the over 80 crowd, people are, are comfortable and most public health units will say three months. Okay, and so Deanna is 82, so she would fall under that three months. That's right. So you're good to go, Deanna. <laughs> so we also have a question from the Krugers. 
I'm wondering whether we should wait to get our next shot. Both, both my husband and the rest of our family have just recovered from having COVID. Mm -hmm. He was in hospital for a week and has just recovered. We've all had the shots that are available and are now waiting to see how long we should wait mm -hmm. to get our next shot. Mm -hmm. um, we certainly don't want this experience again. Never again, especially yeah. not if you've been hospitalized. Again, most public health units will say three months is a reasonable waiting time after, after you've had the infection, if you're older and if you've been ill. I wish it were different. I wish that we could see lasting protection, but with each variant, it's a little bit different. So some of them, you have almost no protection from that, that infection, and some of them you have three or six months. And this is why these blanket recommendations are difficult. The official recommendations are to wait six months since you've been infected, but again, most public health units uh, shrink that time to three months for, for older adults or for people who are planning a surgery, uh, starting chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So for example, people who are starting a new immunosuppressant drug, oftentimes their rheumatologists will recommend they get vaccinated irrespective of any infection history to hold them over while they're on their, that immunosuppressant drug. And so for those people who are, who are looking to get their shots soon, because mm -hmm. I'm hoping after, mm -hmm. after watching this, they, they will, where are these shots available? And I know it does mm -hmm. differ province by province, so whatever information you have That's would right. be great. So most provinces like a pharmacy model, and pharmacists have increased vaccination in Canada tremendously, so shout out to that prof profession. Many still use public health units, mm -hmm. um, and so you generally have to go onto a website and find your public health unit and find the clinic that is. Many family doctors don't offer and recommend you go to one of those other places, and that's because it's difficult to store these vaccines. Yes. But on occasion, if that's where you're most comfortable, or for example, say you have like needle anxiety, you don't wanna have your vaccine in a public place, you feel really uncomfortable with that, many times they can order vaccines from their public health unit, and then you can get that in the doctor's office. So it's worth a phone call if that's where you feel most comfortable. And in terms of everything we've spoken about today, the timing of the vaccines, everything that's coming out, if we were, if I was to have a crystal ball and we were mm -hmm. to look ahead a few years, what do you hope um, comes out of the timing of the vaccines mm -hmm. and the way that we offer them? If we know this is going to be something that is no longer booster after mm -hmm. booster, but just part of our mm -hmm. annual vaccine plan. I'll tell you a story from my own research. So I run, co-run with my amazing colleagues, Canada's biggest study on COVID vaccinations, infections, and long-term care and retirement communities. And of course, long-term care has had so many outbreaks, as have retirement communities. And I remember before the Delta wave, uh, we were looking at the antibodies in the blood of all our participants, and it was not looking very good. And we made this recommendation, and the province of Ontario really quickly implemented a vaccine campaign just as it was creeping up, just as that Delta wave was beginning. And what was so miraculous is despite the fact that people in long-term care are quite ill and quite frail and have lots of medical conditions, the death rate in long-term care was lower than in the general community of people of the same age. And that's because you want to get that vaccine in you right when you're most likely to get infected. It's because that's when you're most likely to get sick, but it also means you're less likely to get sick and spread it and perpetuate that. So if I had my crystal ball, we can do the math of these, these waves pretty well now. And as soon as there's a little increase, they, you know, it looks so small at the beginning, but can get so, so steep. That's when we want to implement these. And for the mRNA vaccines, we need at least, you know, three or four months of warning. So that's why this global surveillance, so we can start to make these predictions and get those vaccines into arms is the best bang for buck. But it's challenging because, like I said, you have to and get people to go and get these vaccines. Uh, I also, if I could crystal ball it, I would say what I would love to see is more vaccine clinics at the places people live. Yes. Retirement communities, community centers. One of the reasons we got to our 80% uptake is many religious communities offer their temple or, or service. Um, uh, in Brampton, you know, we had Sikh community halls mm -hmm. offering these get the vaccines to where it's easy for people to go to and the uptake will increase. If you have to call 12 pharmacies, your family do doctor, you'll give up after a certain point. That's a major lesson learned and I hope we 
keep remembering it. Yeah, and that's the true community development approach. Mm -hmm. You take the intervention to where the community mm -hmm. is at. So just to wrap up, we've talked a little bit about misinformation and mm -hmm. where to find accurate information. And, and I've um, both my producer and I have been leaning on a few websites. One is our own CARP website, carp.ca mm -hmm. backslash protect, which teaches you a lot about mm -hmm. COVID protection. And there's also covid19.ca. Mm -hmm dot can immunize dot ca <laughs> backslash home i'm sure i'm hoping that you're all going to be on the screen um, are there other resources that you um, mm. turn to to find credible information absolutely i mean i like the government of canada and each of the provinces has very good websites i will also put this warning in one of the things that's really challenging in this world is a lot of our social media and facebook being the worst of it often makes things look like news when they're from entertainment websites. Yes. So there are so many people who are getting their information through their social media. And again, I'd suggest following, you know, the CBC and the National Post and the Globe. All our national news sites will feed reliable information. Many of those people who are posting articles that I would consider misinformation are sort of infotainment yes. sites and they're not providing reliable information. And I think it's really challenging for people to discern those two because everything looks like a news headline in these situations. And so the resources you mentioned, I think, are excellent. And I think, you know, looking up your expert. Yes. <laughs> uh, I go ahead, Google me. You know, I, I Google very well. Um, and, and making sure that, you know, people are getting information from reliable experts. Universities are another good source of those. Well, thank you so much mm -hmm. for joining us today, Dr. Bowdish. You are definitely a reliable, incredible source of information, <laughs> so thank you. Please check out everythingexplained.ca to share this episode or watch past episodes of Explained. Signing off from the Zoomerplex in Toronto, I'm Natasha Ray.